This week I want to talk about Bible preservation. I started out talking about the, the, whether the Bible has mistakes or not a few weeks back, and it's turned into a, a small series as I've gotten some feedback of, of people wanting to learn more about this issue of the Bible itself. It's uh, inspiration, preservation, how do we know uh, what we have is God's Word, that sort of business. And uh, we have uh, quite a few resources on this subject on the website, uh, but nothing dealing specifically with translation as much as we've been talking about just recently. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we tried to define what is King James only, as it's a term and a phrase thrown around without much understanding of it, quite frankly, and a lot of misunderstanding on both sides of, uh, of the, uh, the issue. Uh, so we tried to define what that meant and uh, what it means simply to believe your Bible, believe that God inspired it, preserved it without error and mistake, and He promised to do that. Last week, we dealt with Bible version differences, hoping just to raise the issue against the common myth that the Bible versions we have in our language, the multitude of them, <clears throat> really don't differ in, in much of anything of great importance. And uh, that is, we'll see today, a tenet of the modern textual criticism theory, which is that it does not matter which translation you have. None of them are perfect, and uh, none of them differ great enough to alter the essential doctrines of Christianity. Yeah. And we, we dealt with the differences last week and how they do, do speak on and touch on major doctrines of Christianity. And they're very important Will it come to verses removed or words changed or negations which change the verse to say the opposite. In fact, there were so many, we didn't even get through the whole outline, which I won't be able to continue this morning. But uh, we didn't get to the, the verses, say, in John 1.18, where uh, Bibles take the Jehovah's Witnesses reading and making Jesus a begotten God. Or in John 3, when they make a mistake into the text, when they say that Jesus is the, is the only Son of God. And it's not true. You're a Son of God if you're saved by grace. He's actually the only begotten Son of God. And so texts matter in that regard. 1 Timothy 3.16, they remove the word God that was manifest in the flesh and just say He was manifest in the flesh, which isn't saying very much of anything, very revolutionary. And so uh, there's a lot of passages in Scripture that are altered and changed, are different, you can say it that way, just different, that matter. And they're important. And uh, so this week I want to deal with the underlying reason why they differ. And uh, we dealt last week just with the differences. And I kept pointing out that they are different in the main reason because there's an underlying textual problem. Yes. And we dealt with the text versus the words and all that sort of thing. And, and the reason why a lot of modern Bible translations all have the same changes and differences is because they all have the same underlying uh, text and tradition underneath them. And that's a, a primary difference in the Bible versions. And so I want to talk about this issue of Bible preservation and what that means, and why it's a doctrine you have never heard taught about in church before, and why that's a problem, because it's so important, this doctrine of preservation, for whether or not you have the Word of God in your hands. Yes. You may have heard of the doctrine of inspiration. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The word Scripture has to do with things written, script, right? And all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, proof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished into all good works, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. And so it's the, the Scripture was given, the written revelation of God, given by inspiration, so that the man of God can be perfected and can do the good works necessary that God would have us do. Inspiration then, simply defined, is God's words written down. That's a simple definition of the word inspiration. You have revelation, which is God speaking to us. Inspiration is God's words written down. If that's what it is the case, then we can trace the inspiration of the Bible all the way back, we'll just put it across here as a reference point, to the first century. At least that's when it was finished. Major part of the Bible, the Old Testament part of your Bible, was written before then, centuries and millennia before then. The Bible was completed in the first century, thus inspiration done. There's a whole other doctrine of canonization that puts a, a period at the end of inspiration. That's not the, the subject of today. Inspiration is God's Word written down. Preservation, the subject today, is about God's words through history. You live over here. 2022. Year of our Lord, right? Long distance from inspiration. How do you get the Bible, which is here, and I'm going to draw an anachronism, which is a book, in the first century. They didn't have it just in one book. They had things floating around. But the Bible was there inspired. How do you get it from here to there? This is called preservation. And it's this doctrine 
that is confused or taught wrongly or not taught at all, whereby you hear the language that God's word was inspired in the originals, and that's it. Without talking about preservation, you don't have the Bible today. Now, how you talk about preservation will affect, then, how you think about the book you're holding today or not. Right? And this is what we're going to deal with this morning. So preservation is God's words that were already written down, preserved through history, getting to your hands today. When we do a history of the Bible, we can look at our timeline here and say very early in the history of Christianity, and we're not going to do the, the rightly divided timeline of Paul and Peter, we'll just put them all in the first century, uh, the time of the apostles, there was a lot of Christian persecution. It was, it was started by the hands of Saul, by the way, if you want to go that far. Saul began the persecution against the, against the Christian, uh, or at least Peter's group. And then as Paul propagated the doctrine of grace and the gospel of grace of God around the Mediterranean, uh, he was persecuted, and Christians also, as far as Italy and Rome, were persecuted, chased out of the town and the city and other places. So Christian persecution is, the, is what describes the first period here of history. Persecution. Christians in catacombs and in caves running for their lives, and yet God's word was written down. And so they would be making copies, hiding it with them. You might imagine today in North Korea, for example, where Christianity is not allowed, neither Bibles, uh, which is why they float Bibles across the border with balloons, uh, they are not allowed to have the Bible in their hands at all, like literally and legally. And so they memorize it. They memorize the scripture and flush it down the toilet so they're not arrested, but they keep it in their minds because they want it. Christian persecution is what defined the first few centuries of history, uh, modern history. Then you have the Middle Ages, where Christianity became the state religion, if you call it that. Uh, it became normal. Constantine is seen as the figurehead of this shift in history, where he declared uh, Christianity as his religion, the religion of his armies, and so now you didn't have to die if you're a Christian. You just have to die for him, but that's another story. Uh, but you had the Middle Ages where Christianity became the rule, quite, quite literally. The, they, they set up kings and emperors and things like that. Roman Catholicism rose during the Middle Ages here to the point of the next phase of history that you may be familiar with called the Reformation. And we're speaking here about Bible history. Okay, so these things affect the Bible. In the Reformation, there's a, a major shift in that you have this religious institution created here that gets somewhat destroyed or at least divided from during the Reformation as people started to recover or learn or read the actual text of Scripture, which at one point was forbidden. Yeah. Okay, it had been so corrupted you couldn't read the text itself. Now people are saying, let's get back to the text. Ad fontes was the Latin term for go back to the source. Let's read the Scripture. And they did that, and the whole doctrine purification process happened, where it's like we've gotten a far away from what Scripture actually says. And so you have the Reformation there. And it's during this time period where you get a lot of the Bibles in languages, at least in Europe and in, in languages you're familiar with in English, translated into your language. People died for those sorts of things, uh, getting the Bible into the language that you speak. Uh, and then after Reformation, we can maybe categorize the time in which we live modern day. And I know it's, this is a very generic overview of Bible history, but generically, it's in this separation. Persecution, Middle Ages, Reformation, a modern day where we're at. How do we get the Bible from here to there is the doctrine of preservation. How does that work? Now, this is Christian history. You might overlay on this this, this, uh, this identification of the Bible in each of these places. Here you have inspiration, so you have the inspired originals back here. But you're talking centuries removed. Those are going to decompose on the papers that they were written on and the scrolls they were written on. And so you had people running for their lives with the inspired originals or then copies. During the Middle Ages, you had copies and copies. And so what abounded here was more and more copies of the text. Now, these are handwritten copies, mind you, right? Handwritten inspired originals. You want a copy, you've got to write it for yourself. Or someone else writes it or you hire someone to write it. Copies, copies, copies. You had to write your own text of the Bible, which actually is an old thought. Back in Deuteronomy, we'll cover a little bit later, the kings of Israel had to write their own copy of the law. And they, you got an appointed king. You had to write a copy of the law, right? Uh, which means you had to read it, think it, write it. You knew every word of the law, which means you're accountable to it, right? Uh, that would be an impossibility for our commander-in-chief, not the law of Moses. I'm talking about our federal register. It is beyond anyone's capability to write in their lifetime. That's how big our federal register is. 
Uh, the law of the Bible then is a, a relief from that length of, lengthy tome. So they would write their copies. And then in the next form, uh, phase of history, Reformation, you had the printing press. And you had translations starting to be printed. Printing press. Now, the printing press, at the time of the Reformation, are a major, not only contributor to the Reformation in thought. Martin Luther started printing tracts, and it started sparking spark people's thinking. That was like internet today. Information was accessed by everybody, printing press. So this is what describes the Bible in this period of time. The, the Bible was printed. You didn't have to hand write them anymore. And it wasn't just a matter of convenience. It was like multitude. So it took a while to hand write a copy of the scripture or a tract or a book. Printing press could do it a lot faster. Right. So, like I said, similar to the internet age today, where it takes a while to actually print a book as well. You've got to format the thing. You've got to you know, collate it. you get the ink and everything else. But internet, you can write a blog in 30 seconds, post it, done. The whole world sees it, right? Wow, access to information just abounds. So you have, in this phase of history, the printing press, and so Bibles in print form, a, a, a collation. Collation means a collecting and comparing together of all the copies and bringing them together so we can print a book. If we're going to print one, 1,000 copies or 10,000 copies, we want to get it right. So you put them all together so you get the right one, right? And then you have the modern day, and maybe we'll describe this as the day of revision. Revisions. Once you have the copies collated in the printing press, printing Bibles, what else is there to do in the form of the Bible except just to make it perfect, improve upon it, make sure that the errors are removed, right? Revise, revise, revise. And this is where we find ourselves today. And this is the story of Bible history. You can go into more detail in many history books and, and, and classes about the Bible, but the Bible, through history, is one of the most well-attested books in ancient time. Thousands and thousands of manuscripts, I think upwards now of 6,000 uh, manuscripts uh, in Greek are for the New Testament, and many more thousands, lectionaries, books, resources, quotes, debates. There'll be people back here arguing about Scripture, and they'll write something quoting Scripture in it, or they'll have like hymnals that quote Scripture in it, or pastor's sermons that were written down have Scripture in it. Thousands and thousands of references, including the texts themselves, to the Bible throughout history. Okay? It's one of the most well-attested books in his human history. It really is. If you want to look back in ancient uh, human history here and, hi and find out wh what do we know that people said and wrote, some ancient historians people allude to, whether it be Josephus or you know, the, the, uh, Ptolemy and these historians, have far fewer uh, witnesses in history, which is to say that there's far fewer copies of what they wrote. Right? Homer's Iliad and this sort of thing, people compare. These are one of the <laughs> oldest books, Homer's Iliad, back from the Greek Empire, right? Very, very few in comparison to Scripture which thousands and thousands. Okay. The Bible approved them by thousands of manuscripts, lectionaries, and writings. But now, in 2022, in our modern day, we live in a time of great apostasy. And I say that, and everyone says amen, especially in these times. But what I mean specifically, apostasy is the word that means falling away from. And apostasy is losing something you had. It's not just great wickedness and sin, which the world's been in since Genesis chapter 3. It's that... We lived at a time but we had something and we're falling away from it. We've lost it. Apostasy, where Bible preservation, the doctrine of Bible preservation is concerned. It's not taught. People don't understand it. They don't know what it means. That simple description I gave you about inspiration back here and preservation being the doctrine of God's will through history is not communicated. It's not understood. People ask, what Bible should I use? Where should I find the Bible? Which Bible is the best? How do I know? And this doctrine is never communicated. That is the doctrine that matters when you ask those questions. Which Bible should I use in 2022? You better know what that is, how that works. Does the Bible teach it? How does it happen? Because that will give you information about where to find which Bible you should use. Let's talk about, since we're in the modern day, modern rejection of biblical preservation of that doctrine. It might shock you uh, to find out that in just in recent times, meaning the last 150, 200 years, uh, there has been a, a guild, a, a, a group of textual critical experts in languages and philology. And they have been deemed the authority on which Bible we should use, without question in many places. And so because of that, 
what they think about Bible preservation matters greatly for the state of our understanding of the Bible, Hosea 22. <clears throat> okay, this is the time in which we live. And modern Christians, because of the disbelief of these experts, do not believe in preservation. They don't know what it is, or they just disbelieve it. What they rather believe in or think about when they refer to the Scripture is reconstruction of the Bible by experts. I told you there's experts on languages, Greek, Hebrew, philology, linguistics. They trust the experts to identify for us what the Bible is, which parts are truly the Bible, which are not truly the Bible, and to give us the Bible. You say, well, yeah, well, I'm not, I don't know languages. I don't know history. How am I supposed to know the difference? Well, this is the doctrine of preservation. I want to communicate today what this biblical doctrine is and how every member of the church, every Christian, can know the doctrine just as well as they can know the doctrine of salvation, just as well as they can know the doctrine of who they are in Christ and understand the Bible they hold is the Word of God without needing a whole community of secular experts or Christian experts to tell them what the Bible is. Amen. Okay? You can be persuaded in your own mind about the issue, Romans 14, 5, just like you do other issues and doctrines of the Bible. And this is something very different the way I'm talking. Because usually it comes out as if this subject of the Bible and its transmission through history is so complicated and so beyond your understanding, you really need years and years of training and preparation and very advanced topics where you even begin to understand the details of ancient Greek and Hebrew and Latin and, and all sorts of languages and things. And there's no way you can possibly just trust the experts. Right? And I'm telling you, what if you don't have to? What if that's the wrong place to put your trust? What if the experts don't believe the right doctrine of preservation? Because when you come to using the Bible, when you come to believing the Bible, faith is personal, folks. Faith cannot be imputed. And if you believe the Bible is the Word of God, which means it's inspired, what if the people giving you your Bible did not? What if they did? You would think that would matter. And what we're told today is it doesn't matter whether they believe it or not. It's purely a neutral science, and they were simply doing their scientific job, and so you can just receive like, from your doctor. It doesn't matter what your doctor believes, right? Or does it? Well, it doesn't matter what they believe. Well, I mean, what they believe about health, bodies, where we came from? It might. Yeah. You know what you're doing. What you believe might matter. Modern Christians don't know what the preservation is or don't believe it as a whole. They believe in reconstructing the Bible from experts. Experts' job is to dig in the dirt and find the manuscripts and to learn the Greek and Hebrew so that we can have a properly translated Bible in our language today. Now, I say that as the goal of modern-day textual criticism, but notice what I just explained to you is biblical history. Inspired originals, copies and copies, printing press, translation, collation, or in the day of revision but they're wanting to retranslate it. And that's because they think something different than what's happened throughout history. And we'll see that here in a moment. The modern theory of preservation goes like this. That the Bible was inspired in the originals. Now, some critics believe that, some don't. By inspiration, we mean God's words written down. Some believe, there were, they all believe there was words written down, whether they're God's words or not is the difference. Right? But they all believe there are words written down. I don't want to concede that because I believe there are God's words written down. But they all believe that. What happened after they were written down? Well, before the fourth century, or in this first phase of biblical history, before the Middle Ages, the New Testament was lost, which is to say it did not become very popular. Okay? And so because of the persecution, we lost as the church the true readings that were in the original text. Okay. Now, what I'm telling you here is I know a simplification, but also a very general explanation of modern Bible preservation thinking te or textual critic theory. Okay. The New Testament was lost in the, by the 4th century, and for the next 1,500 years, I didn't write to you how long these periods were, for the next 1,500 years, which is the time period between here and here, for the next 1,500 years, they didn't have an accurate Bible. Okay, call it what you will, corrupt, changed, different, added to, rescinded. It was not the true readings. For 1,500 years, where the church was now legal and growing a building or running away from each other, 1,500 years, until it was rediscovered. In fact, 1,500 includes this, uh, this period here. Until it's rediscovered in the 19th century. In the 19th century, in the 1800s, you had different gentlemen going around collecting ancient documents, and they found 
a few documents that were biblical. They found them in the Vatican. They found them in uh, uh, Mount Sinai uh, a temple there, a monastery. And these copies, they dated way back here to this first phase of Christian history. And they said, so we've lost the true readings until rediscover the 19th century. And their teaching is, we found them. So now that we've found them and they differ from what we've been having for 1,500 years, we're going to revise the Bible according to those things we've found. Okay. This is the modern theory of preservation. How did God preserve his word? Well, they were written, corrupted, lost, hidden in dark circles, 1,500 years later, redug out of the dirt, and now experts put that back into scripture for us. Okay. As they continue finding more evidences and things in the dirt. What has happened then in this explanation of preservation is that Bible belief has been traded for what they call neutral science. This is a myth of, of many different perspectives. Uh, they think, well, science is neutral, um, and so science will tell us what is right and wrong and true and false, and uh, your beliefs don't matter whatsoever. And this has been, that was the change in the 19th century between people who believed in faith and the rationalistic modern idea. But the Bible believes in trade for neutral science and perfect preservation of the Bible, or God's providential pre preservation, has been turned into a book that is simply good enough. Instead of saying, well, we need God's words written down perfectly preserved for us now so that we have the same thing here, here. Instead of that idea, the teaching is we cannot have what they had there. Nobody can. The closest we can get is the closest we can get, and that's just going to have to be good enough. And by the way, it doesn't affect any major doctrine. Okay. Now, I, I wonder how they know that, since they don't believe they know what that said. Right? Because that's the thought. The thought is preservation doesn't work that way. Preservation is just what we find in the dirt. And it's what we found. We found some really old things, but nobody has the originals, which nobody does. And so we can get close enough, but we can't get exactly, but we can make that guess. How do you know if the Bible is corrupted so early that you have anything even remotely close to it? Right? Well, they don't. Well, and that is the, the modern state of textual critical theory about the Bible, is that you cannot be absolutely certain about the Scripture. You say, that's, that's not true, Justin. You're just impugning people. Well, let's, let's hear what they, what they say. Okay. In an introduction, a popular introduction of the Greek New Testament, here's what a textual critic writes. I do not believe that God is under any obligation to preserve every detail of Scripture for us. Even though he granted to us good access to the text in the New Testament, he's saying there's not perfect access. We don't really know for certain. Peter Gurry, who's a young and upcoming textual critic scholar, written books just recently about Bible translation issues, trying to dispel some of the, what he thinks are myths about Bible preservation. He says, we are trying, as an industry of textual critics, we are trying to piece together a puzzle with only some of the pieces. That's our job. Which is to say, they don't know what the puzzle looks like, they don't have all the pieces, and they're trying to reconstruct the thing. Well, what's the puzzle? The Bible. Right? So, the, the, what they admit is that we're putting together the Bible, that's our job, to put it back together. Why? Because it's been broken, is what they say. We're putting back together the puzzle pieces we find. We don't have all the pieces. And by the way, we don't know what the cover looks like. This is their own words. Okay. Daniel Wallace, who in, in all other perspectives would be considered a conservative. In fact, he, he, he taught, I think he still teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary. Dispensational seminary, historically speaking. So conservative from that regard. He's not someone who disbelieves in inspiration. He doesn't disbelieve in Christ's deity. He, he's, he's a fundamental, essential believer in those Christian doctrines as far as it goes. Now, he's not a mid access sensationalist by any means, but he, he's on that side of the liberal conservative spectrum of textual critic scholars. He writes that I am not convinced that the Bible speaks of its own preservation. That doctrine was first introduced in the Reformation period in the Westminster Confession, but it's not something that can be found in Scripture. That's what he says. He says, first, I want to affirm with all evangelical Christians that the Bible is the Word of God. It's inerrant, it's inspired, and our final authority for faith in life. This is an important book. That's my adding that part, you know. It's the Word of God, inerrant, inspired. And then he goes on to say, we do not have now in any of our critical Greek texts or in any translations exactly what the authors of the New Testament wrote. Even if we did, we would not know it. There are many, many places in the text of the New Testament that is uncertain. Same man said both of those things. I believe the Bible is the word of God, inerrant, and we don't really know what it is. 
But see, that's the statement that has been passed around through churches. You'll see it in their statements of faith quite frequently. We believe Holy Scripture inspired without error the Word of God in the originals. Where are the originals? Inspiration. God wrote down the words originally. What's preservation? God's words transmitted through history. And by that, like, the words God wrote down. Yeah. So the inspired words, the pure words, the holy words, the sound words, written down, transmitted through history, that's preservation. If God promises this, then the modern textual critical theory is wrong. If God did not, then I guess we have to do the best we can to reconstruct something from a puzzle, but we don't know what it looks like. Right? Which is where we're at. Do you see how the idea of the industry of textual critical theory in modern times can dissuade believing every word of your Bible? Yeah. We wouldn't know even if we had it if it were true. And the more manuscript evidence we find, the more updates we make to the scriptures, means more changes could be coming, right? So how can you be certain? In fact, the, the statement is, we cannot be certain about many places of the Bible, right? That's just how it is, I guess. We have to live in a state of uncertainty about the words of God. Does it really matter? The statement, it was written by men. You ever heard that idea about the Bible? It was written by men. You know, Christians say this now when you talk about Bible preservation or, or translation. We believe that the Bible or the authorized version or any Bible is God's perfectly preserved Word of God. Well, you know, it was just translated by men. It was written by men. You know, men, men, men. Men are sinners. Men are wicked. Men also just make sincere mistakes. Forget the, the moral intent or not. People make mistakes. And this is true. I agree. Men are fallible. But when God speaks words and writes them down, God is infallible. Amen. His words then, as evangelicals state today, was perfectly inspired, without error, infallible. And by the way, he used men to do it. Yes. So men weren't only in the process of preservation, they were in inspiration as well. So if you agree that God, infallible being, wrote down words through fallible beings, why couldn't God, fallible being, preserve words through fallible beings? Yes. You see? But the idea that it was written by men was actually popularized in the 19th century, the same, not coincidentally, century where they were finding these new manuscripts that disagree with history. It was popularized in the 19th century by unbelieving modernist textual critics. And that's to say that in the 18th century, there was a whole crisis of faith going on in some circles of the world, Europe mainly. And the crisis of faith was the intellectuals of the day started disbelieving what had been the state religion for so long. Like, we're all Trinitarian, we're all believe Jesus is God, and they said, well, you know, we're too smart for that now. We don't actually believe all those fundamentals. And thus, the debate in the early 20th century was the fundamentals of the faith. Fighting against these modernists who wanted to say, well, we're too advanced, and we've progressed in scientific knowledge and sophistication to believe such silly, archaic ideas, old-fashioned ideas. By the way, what they were referring to when they talked about these old ideas was also the Bibles produced during these old times. They put them together. We need a newer, updated text, right, based on the things we found in the dirt now. It was written by men. That's what their statement was. Conservatives would say, the Bible is the word of God. They'd hold the Bible and say, the word of God is what this is. What a privilege it is to have it. And modern scholars would say, nah, I don't know. There's more questions about it, more doubts. And, you know, men wrote that book. They started studying this style in which the books were written and saying, well, look, you see, there's personal influence among the authors. Matthew that's the way he sounds when he writes, and Mark, that's the way he sounds when he writes, and this is what scholars spend their time doing. And, and so it didn't seem like that the authors were really authentic. In fact, even to this day, in a lot of these circles, they'll say that Paul didn't write half his epistles, because they'll read them and say, well, that doesn't sound like Paul. So, you know, men wrote, and men's thoughts and opinions influenced the text. And so it was just written by men, was their mantra. It was during this time that Christians responded, the believers responded with, well, yeah, it was men, but God used men as tools. You've heard this type of idea, right? As instruments. Well, this, this was language that was being developed in the 18th, 19th century because the attack was it was written by men. The Christians responded with, well, yeah, but they were just instruments of inspiration. God was perfect. And by the way, that's true. God was perfect in instrumentation, right? But what they did is started compromising on other areas. The statement of inerrant in the originals only. We brought that a couple times today. That statement, inerrant in the originals only, without error in the originals, was the Christian's response to the book you have was written and translated by men. The Christian response was, well, the original was perfect. God wrote it without error. So we can still say it's the infallible Bible 
originally. And what have they done? They've responded, but lost the battle. Because the battle was over whether the book you have in your hand was the Word of God. And the Christian response was, well, this one might have mistakes, and we're still learning, and maybe there's problems here that men introduced. We're revising it after all. But the original, without error. And they totally conceded the idea. So popularized by 19th century Christians who compromised on preservation was in the originals only. It's interesting how common the belief is that we believe in the originals only. God made an infallible book. But when you say that God made a book I hold my hand, and it alone is the word of God, something only, that's the most offensive thing to say today. We started that last week, right? Eugene Nita and others said, there is no way you can have any translation that is the exact words of God. Or any book today that is the exact word of God. Word of God. That's the offense in modern theory, is to say, I have a book, and this book alone is the Word of God. Amen. People aren't offended as much at the King James part of King James only. It's the only part that they're offended at. Yeah. And as we said before, if you hold another book, the NIV, New American Standard, God forbid, and say, that only is the Word of God, at least we have a commonality that God preserved His book. We just disagree on where He did it. Right? But you see, the issue is preservation. Before you talk about translation, before you talk about which English Bible, you have to understand whether God promised to preserve His Word and how He did it. Okay? Do we have a Bible we can hold anywhere today and say, this is the Word of God without error and infallible, or do we not? And we have to say with the scholars, even the conservative ones, that there are many uncertain places in the Bible. And even though it's the Word of God and I affirm that, we wouldn't even know if we had the original. Okay? That shows disbelief in the idea that God preserves it. If God preserves the Bible as it was inspired, as the church used to confess, that means at any time in history, people could say, they could say, this is the pure words of God. In fact, the Westminster Confession in 1643, which is during this time here, that's exactly what they said. They said God preserved it, and then he made it pure throughout all ages, which is a preservation statement. He didn't inspire it throughout all ages. He inspired it in the original, and then throughout all ages, kept it pure for the church to have and use. Yeah. That's the doctrine of preservation. But the idea of preservation today is that God's words, they exist. Where's God's words, you ask? And they say, well, they're out there, like in our storage rooms of manuscript evidence. We've got thousands of manuscripts. We've got things we're still looking for. In the door. We've got teams of people, archaeologists, digging things up. And God's words exist somewhere. They might still yet be unknown to us in some places, but... God preserved them somewhere. Well, this is reconstruction, isn't it? This means that you can't say, I have God's word right here. You're saying it's somewhere else or somewhere that we have to figure out. And so it's a place in a position of uncertainty and question. That's the modern teaching of the Bible. The idea that new, no major doctrines are affected, we covered a little bit last week, is the new Christian orthodoxy, or rather unorthodoxy, about changes in the Bibles. Because there's revisions happening, and every time they find something, they'll update the scripture. And so, what do you say about those changes? Ah, uh, they're okay. Why are changes in the Bible okay? Because it doesn't affect any major teaching. Well, what if it's less about the teaching, or what if the actual teaching I'm talking about is the doctrine of preservation? The doctrine of preservation is harmed greatly when you change the Bible. It doesn't affect any major doctrine. They don't believe in preservation. You see the issue? You wonder why it's not just having new translations, that's the issue, folks. The NIV has been updated almost half a dozen times. The New American Standard is working on its third update, or, or more. It's like these things get updated on their own. Like the New American Standard, the, let's use the ESV as an example, as it, it came out in the early, late 90s and early 2000s, it's been updated two or three times already. And the ESV and some of the readings in the Bible have gone back and forth. At first, they disagree with the King James Bible. In the next edition, they agree with the King James Bible. In the third one, they disagree again. Why do they go back and forth? What, I mean, are, they, are they undecided? I mean, they go through a lot of work to print these Bibles. The translation, the revision, the, there's a lot of time and effort spent and money spent on these things. Why do they keep changing them? The same translation, right? Well, you could say to, to make money, that could be true, except that it's the same translation. Isn't ESV and ESV and ESV? I mean, we talk about comparing the King James to the ESV or NIV or American Standard, but isn't those translations the same? And they're not. They keep updating. Why? Because the underlying thinking about how we get our Bible, their idea of preservation, is that when we find a new manuscript, we have to start all over 
in our Bible production and consider what we've now found that we didn't know before. In fact, that's what they'll tell you in the preface of these Bibles. They'll say, with modern technology and modern discoveries, we have to update the text. That is their articulating their doctrine, or rather disbelief in biblical preservation, when they say, when we find more, we'll continue to reconstruct. Which is why the changing process, even in the new translations, will never end, because it's tied to what they find newly discovered. Right? What if what we're looking for is not something newly discovered, but something we've always had? Amen. Do you need to change it at that point? No. You see the difference? The doctrine of preservation biblically is something that's always there. If it's always there, you don't need to find it again or rediscover the thing as if you didn't have it before. And if you did find something else, you would compare it with what you already had. Right? So there should be less and less change. Right? Yes, a process of collation. Yes, a, a process of identifying. Well, that's not right. And this is, this is a, this is a corrupt text there. But it should be a refining so that you get God's Word perfectly preserved. That's the doctrine of the Scripture not constantly being updated as we find new manuscripts. The statement, we consistently find new manuscripts. And they say that in pride, like, this is why we exist. To find new manuscripts and to update the Bible for you. You have the latest scholarship technology, which constantly changes. That's science for you, right? What they have right now is true until next week, because that's how science works. And if that's how science works, then that's a real danger for the Bible. Yeah. Okay. The Bible is not preserved that way. But this is why modern Bibles are inconsistent with themselves, not just with the King James Bible, with themselves. Okay. So now to say, I believe God's per perfectly preserved words in my hand, the book I have in my hand are God's perfectly preserved words to say that, which is a matter of belief, by the way. You say that in the context of modern textual criticism, and they will laugh at you because their thinking is to know that you have what was inspired in the beginning is to say you have all knowledge and you know everything there is to know about textual criticism of languages and historical documents. That's what they think. And that's, of course, absurd. I do not. Neither do you. Amen. They conclude then that you then can't have God's perfectly preserved words. The difference is it's my belief. I didn't just create it, by the way. We'll cover this in a moment. That's something I just will into existence. It's a doctrine taught. Just like my salvation, I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. Yes. Well, you haven't really considered whether Jesus was actually a true historical figure or all the historical documents that whether it prove his existence or not. Or maybe in question is the fact that the Bible maybe invented some things about him. Bart Ehrman, textual critic extraordinaire, has written things just like that. That in the first few centuries, Christians created the idea that Jesus was God and added that to the scripture. So that for 1,500 years, that was the thought. Whoops. Right? We thought he was God. Well, let's update that. Now, last week we covered differences, didn't we? And some of the differences affected some of these things. Yeah. And what I'm telling you, this is not a secret, folks. People are just ignorant of it. Like, they tell you what they're doing and why they're doing it. They don't believe in preservation as biblically taught. They don't believe the Bible teaches preservation. In fact, a common statement is when you say, I think God perfectly preserves his words, especially maybe in the King James Bible, is show me a verse that teaches that. Which verse says the King James Bible is God's probably preserved word? End of story. Mic drop, right? Well, actually, show me a verse that says you're saved. Hmm? 1 Corinthians 15, Romans chapter 3, your name's not there. How do you know you are saved? You. Not the Romans, not the Ephesians. You. It's the same difference, folks. You say, oh, I believe those words. And I believe those words, as originally written, were given to the church throughout all ages. Amen. And preserved so that I can read them, yeah. believe them, and therefore I know I'm saved. Yeah. That's how preservation works too. I believe God wrote his words to be used and preserved. And when I read them, I can see that the words that I'm reading are the words of God. Even though they aren't the originals. Right? Because God's preservation. So, it is a matter of faith. I get that. And in the realm of neutral science where faith is disallowed, that is absurd to think about. But what you get here is constant change. What you get by faith is stability and strength and truth because you're believing the Word of God, if indeed He preserves the Bible. Do you see the difference? But when you say that today, I believe God's perfectly preserved words, and in my outline, I didn't even say the King James. I keep saying that, not to be soft on the King James, folks. Just to try to avoid the knee jerk reaction when you say King James. 
the Bible I have is the King James, authorized version. 1769, not 1611. Other editions and printings and things like that considered. But it's about preservation. That's the real issue. When you go immediately to translation, you've forgotten the big issue about preservation. What do you believe about this? And if you believe any of your English Bible and you say it's God's perfectly preserved words in English, you'll be called a heretic. Okay? The discouragement, and again, this is explained to you in seminaries and Bible schools. If any man tells you that any book today is God's perfectly preserved words and you should only use the one book, you should be careful, it's a cult. Why is it a cult to think that God wrote one book and he preserves one book? We need to simply identify where that's at. That's why we draw the charts and had to talk about it and where it's at, because that is a question. Where is it? But asking which one or where is it is very different than you can never have it. It's a very different position, right? Anymore, no one's asking the question, which one? They're saying any Bible will do. Okay? You can't say just one is what they're saying. So it's not which one, it's if you say one, you're done, right? Which verse tells us which Bible? Tell me a verse that tells me what translation to use, that, that shows me God's fairly preserved Word of God. To which the response should be, know you not the doctrines about the Bible? There's a whole category of systematic theology called bibliology. I know I'm dumping a bunch on you here, but I'm, I'm trying to give you your money's worth. You go, you go to seminary, <laughs> and some of you got that joke when you did. Right, at seminary, you learn systematic theology which is to say the doctrines of the Christian faith, the categorized and organized as scholars like to do, into different departments of theology, right? You have a whole field of study on the deity of Christ, Christology, or a whole field of study on salvation, soteriology, or the Holy Ghost, pneumatology. So they categorize them, right? It's like topics. There's a whole category of study called bibliology, which is not a study of the doctrines of salvation or of the future things or the Holy Ghost, but a doctrine about the Bible itself. So when you ask, which verse tells us which Bible, this is a very naive type of question, because people have been studying for centuries the topic of bibliology, or is the Bible inspired? Is it preserved? Is it canonized? Does it have authority? How do we know? This has been a field of study for a long time. Only recently have many of these doctrines been rejected by the field of experts, which includes believers and unbelievers, because it's a neutral science. And we've got to make sure we're all on the same page about the science, so whether you believe inspiration or not doesn't matter greatly. Right? But doctrines of the Bible, which means you have to believe the doctrines, exist. Preservation as a doctrine, preservation as a process, happens after the promise is given. You understand? Just like your salvation. The verses you trust for your eternal soul salvation were written, inspired, 2,000 years ago. You didn't get saved until much, much later. So they were written down, and then, boom, miracle happened with you thousands of years later when you got saved, right? Preservation works the same way. Preservation promised, but it actually gets performed through history. You understand? So looking at history is significant. Just like today, where even though there's no Bible that tells you to put the gospel on a piece of paper, print it out, and give it to someone, why do you do that? Or make a website and put God's words on there. Why do you do that? No one tells us to put pews in a certain direction, put a pulpit up here. Why do we do that? We do these things because we know the purpose of God's word and will, which is to see all men saved. Yeah. And that's what he said 2,000 years ago, and we try to do that with the means and resources that we have. Right? Preservation is similar. It requires faith. Salvation doesn't occur to you without faith. Yeah. Preservation does not occur in history without faith. Faith. It doesn't exist. So the admission by textual critics that it's a neutral science, faith is disallowed, is an admission that there is no biblical preservation, which is what they also say. We don't believe in the doctrine. Right? Without the biblical belief of preservation, there is no preservation, which is to say what? We live in a time of apostasy of the belief, which means there's no preservation of the Word of God happening where there's disbelief going on. Understand? This could, we'll talk about this in a moment. Part of how God preserves His Word is through the effectual working of those that believe. Without the belief, that's not where you find his word. How do I know where to find the word of God? Is what we're trying to figure out. You probably look where people believe it. Right? Amen. I give you a history of the Bible, and some of you that uh, may be more international or cultured may say, oh, wait a minute, Justin, you gave a correction. Western history of the Bible. European-centered history of the Bible. And indeed, you are correct. Why did I do that? 
because there is no other history. So that's very racist of you. I'm not trying to be racist. It's just studying history. I'm not racist, okay? That's not the thing. It's China did not preserve the Bible. Didn't happen, right? There wasn't like a process of preservation in China, in Beijing, saying, you know what? We had the Bible for 2,000 years here. Didn't happen. Why? They didn't believe it. They rejected it. Paul was sent west. Again, this is not, it has nothing to do with cultural priority, folks. It's just a statement of history. Paul went west to Macedonia and Greek. He didn't go to India. He didn't go to the Philippines. He went west, which is to say early on in history, you had Rome, the Romans, understanding Christianity. Many of them did not. Some of them did. From Rome, Spain, and Britain, and other places in history, right? Europe. That's where Christianity was centered in history. Missionaries traveling across the world, but it was centered here. So the fact that there would be a printing press invented and the Bible translated and collated there was because there's many copies there. That's what you would expect. Are there copies in Africa? Yes. Are there copies in other places in Eastern Europe? Yes. But what you don't find is Jesus in Central America. Unless you go to the Mormon Tabernacle, then you'll see pictures of him in Central America. It's anachronistic, right? But so Bible history is what I'm telling you has, is in a certain place in history as well. Well, how do I know God's Word is preserved? Where do I find it? Probably in the places where people used it and believed it. That'd be a good guess. But it's better than a guess, folks, because I'll show you verses here in a moment. That's how God described how He preserves it. Okay? We need the words of God, Amen. without which we have no life. You have no salvation. To say the words of God are without error in the originals, but we don't have them today, is to make the originals worthless. It's of no profit to you to say God inspired his words perfectly a long time ago, and now we don't know for certain. Now Christians get around this by saying, well, don't worry, we also believe that no major doctrine has been lost. How do you know based on your own theories of preservation? They don't know. They can't know, as Mr. Wallace said. Okay. We need the words of God. Matthew 4, 4, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every yeah. word, we need every word. Right? 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says that it effectually, the word of God, which Paul spoke, which they received as the word of God, not the word of men. They could have said, well, Paul, you're just a man. And many people did. Instead, they said, you're speaking the words of God. Hearing what he's saying and the evidence thereby, you're the word of God. Or you're speaking the word of God. And he said, you receive what I said to you as the word of God, which effectually worketh in you that believe. Amen. Without the belief, does the word of God work in you? No. You see? So when I say we need the word of God, I'm talking about not only our salvation, our life, I'm talking about it working. If it's going to work in your life, it's going to change who you are, it's going to save you, you need to believe it. If you have nothing to believe, or you don't know what to believe, or you're uncertain about what you're believing, then there's going to be a problem with it's working. Amen? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Yeah. If you don't have the Word of God, you don't have faith. Oh, I got faith, you can't tell me what I believe. But you don't believe the Word of God, which means your faith is not defined by God. Yeah. It's invented by you. Or experts, they'll tell you what to believe. We covered last week that there are many places that differ in, Bible, in, in Bibles. Different places, different verses, different uh, uh, renderings, translations, what have you. Right? That affect many different understandings. You know, in Galatians 2, verse 20, you know that verse, don't you, being Pauline? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You know, nevertheless I live is taken out of Bibles that consult other manuscripts for their translation today. Nevertheless I live is taken out, which means it says I'm crucified with Christ and I don't live. Christ does. Well, it teaches the resurrection of Christ, but not yours. So how can it work in you if you don't know that you're resurrected with Christ in Galatians 2, verse 20? Well, you get a copy of Romans, learn it there. Well, if Galatians is supposed to teach it, which I think it is, because it makes a mistake there, then maybe it should stay there. People respond sometimes with them saying, well, we did not remove verses from the Bible. According to our theory, we found the text back here, which means you guys added it in the King James. Well, if that's true, then why'd you leave the verse numbers in? Yeah. Maybe you should take them out. Whoops. If they're not supposed to be there. You're just adding confusion by adding a number. It's not supposed to be there. But secondly, what if and how do you know that's the original reading? It's closer to the originals. Really? But how many people were using that thing? Was it copied? Not very much. Hmm. Was it printed when people were using these documents? No. So you just found it, and it looked really old, 
So you said that must be it. That's the best. Yep. Like that's, that's the depth of it, folks. It really is. Okay, read it for yourself. The books are technical, but that's the theory. They start with assumptions of how they identify text. If it's older, it's better. If it's less used, it's better. In fact, if it's different than what we have, it's better. That's what they say. So in their very definition and premise of identifying the Bible, they're saying if it's not what we have, that's how we know it's truer, which denies preservation. That's it. it should be if it's consistent with what we have, that's how we know it's truer. But that's the opposite of modern textual translation theory. There's a reason why we had a Bible for hundreds of years, and I say a Bible not because of my own agenda, but because that's how it was. It was just an English Bible until the 19th century. And suddenly, many Bibles. What changed? The underlying thinking about how we identify the Scripture. What was lost wasn't even the Bible, folks. What was lost was the belief in preservation. Because we still have the Bible today. Yeah. We do. I don't think we've lost it. I believe in preservation. Yeah. Others don't. This is why they can't know, and anyone will do, because this is as much as we can get, as best we can know. All right, moving on. Romans 15, 4, Paul says the scripture written a fourth time was written for our learning. You don't have the scripture, the thing's written down, you don't learn, do you? You can't understand. 2 Timothy 2, 15, study to show yourself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of the truth. Can't do it without the word of truth. Amen. Right? 2 Timothy chapter 3 Verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. You can't do those four things unless you have scripture. And more specifically, all scripture. Amen. doesn't say if you have enough scripture or some scripture, which actually in other versions it does. Versions matter, folks. All scripture is the claim of the reformers. Sola scriptura. They, love, they wrote books and tomes about 2 Timothy 3.16. Because all scripture is what perfects the man of God, not the magisterium and the Catholic priesthood and religious tradition. Amen. Scripture is what the reformer said. But if you don't believe that, like if you don't think we need the actual written words of God and we can still be Christian, then maybe you should go back before the Reformation and just consult religious tradition. Which, by the way, is a lot of the textual critical industry. Right? Religious tradition. Oh, don't worry, their beliefs don't affect their thinking. Right. Ephesians 6.17 says to put on the armor of God, right? The whole armor of God. The whole armor, not just parts of it. And the whole armor includes a sword. You remember what the sword is from Sunday school? The sword is the word of God, the sword of the spirit. If you don't have the word of God, what are you missing? Sword. There you go. You can play defense, I guess, but that's it. And so Ephesians 6.17 now, why did God inspire his words? We need his words. Why did he inspire them? 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, 15 and 17, tell us why. In 2 Timothy 3, 15, Paul tells Timothy that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. How did the scriptures benefit Timothy when he, from a child? They can make him wise to salvation. Right? If he doesn't have the scriptures, then he can't be saved. Oh, they don't affect any major doctrine. You don't even believe we have them preserved. Forget the major doctrines. You don't think we have the words of God, and you wouldn't know if you see them. I believe I have them. Amen. Right? You say, well, I do it too, and I got an ESV. Well, then fine. You believe your ESV is the word of God perfectly preserved, because that's the biblical doctrine. And we can talk about how you're wrong, right, about, some, about translation, identification, because that's a different thing, folks. Identifying what are you believing which one is different than you believing that God has preserved one. That's a different teaching. I'm telling you, the mud is deeper than what you think. It's not just about translations. Why did God inspire his words? 2 Timothy 3.15 says, for salvation. Verse 17 talks about service. You're saved, and it is profitable for doctrine, correction, reproof. That's growing up. Instruction and righteousness. That what? What's the end goal here? The man of God may be perfect. Right? Perfect. That, that, that doesn't mean sinless. It means complete. Like there's nothing lacking. Like put on the whole armor, right? You got perfect armor. You got every piece. If you got a piece missing, it's imperfect armor. Right? So you need all scripture that the man of God may be perfect. And this was the doctrine of sola scripture and the benefit and profitability of the Bible to every believer, you included, like everybody. Right? You believe that, right? That God, his word is for your profit, for your instruction, for your growth, for your perfection. Do you see how that's tied to preservation? Amen. If you don't have it through history today in your hands, then you cannot accomplish, God can't accomplish that. Because it's through his words that that's accomplished. Isaiah 55, 11, the Bible talks about 
how God's word will not return unto him void. It will do what he purposes, what it accomplishes, right? If his purpose was to see people saved and serving, the man of God may be perfect, don't you think that would accomplish that? If that was going to accomplish it in more people than in the first century, it has to be preserved. Do you see that? Yeah. I mean, it, maybe he was only talking about Timothy being perfect. Or was he talking about every part of the church to be perfect? Well, if it's every part of the church, which means the church exists throughout history, if the church exists, the word must exist. Amen. That's interesting teaching. Didn't Paul teach we're members of his body? Yeah, yeah he sure did. There's a connection between God working in the world and his words that work in you. If you don't have his words, God can't work in you. You say, well, I'm saved. I believe it. That's the only thing I know. I'm saved by Jesus Christ. Then you better believe in the preservation of the Bible, folks. That's elementary. That's foundational. Or else we can question some of these things. Inspiration is God's words written down. If you add to inspiration, the words written down, this idea of utilization, that you have to use them. You need them today over here. He wrote them, and I need them, not just because I want them, but because God needs them to accomplish his purposes. And for God to accomplish his purposes today, preservation is the promise. You see, that's where that comes in. That's how you get the doctrine of preservation. How much must he preserve? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture. Amen. Well, we've got the important parts of most of the books. So he says the important parts of most of the books are inspired by God and profitable for you. All scripture. Okay. It's what you need to make man of God perfect. What if you don't have all the armor, all the word of God? Then you can't be perfected according to it. Right? Matthew 5.18, how much must he preserve? Matthew 5.18 is one of the most significant, along with 2 Timothy 3.16, passages on preservation in the Bible. Show me a verse that I know tells me which Bible. Well, the Bible teaches preservation. And when you know what preservation is, it will help you identify it. Matthew 5.18, verily I say unto you, this is red, red letters if you have that Bible, it's Jesus, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Jesus is God. That's not an invented doctrine. The Bible teaches that. That's a doctrine preserved in the words of God, which are perfectly preserved. Matthew 5, 18, Jesus speaks as God. He says, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle. Jot and tittle. Those are the smallest characters in the written language. So how much must be preserved? Well, the meaning is it's, it's disattached from the words. Jots and tittles, that's like the characters of yeah. the letters of the words. Words matter. Meaning is encapsulated in words. Jesus says, jots or tittles will no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. Now, how long must he preserve it? He says, till heaven and earth pass. Yeah. Has that happened yet? No, Matthew 24, verse 35, Jesus himself said again, Heaven and earth shall pass, but my word shall never pass away. Amen. Hmm. So even if heaven and earth pass, God's word still exists. That's interesting. Psalm 119 says, The word of the Lord is settled forever in heaven. Yeah. He also inspired it for us to use down here in the church. If God is operating the church today, his word must be preserved for us to use it. Amen. I know Matthew 5 is talking about Israel. This is talking about a promise of preservation. He says, Heaven and earth shall pass. That's future. It should not pass from the law. That's in the past. The law was given a long time before Jesus said this. So past and future preservation. Jesus, in his timeline in Matthew 5, was speaking about a past inspiration, was standing in the middle of history saying, this is the word of God, and saying, in the future, it's going to be around still. That's preservation. Yeah. What was given will remain. Preservation, do you see? Matthew 5, verse 18. How long will it endure? Forever. 1 Peter 1, verse 25 says, The word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. 1 Peter 1, 25. If the gospel is to be preached with any sort of effectiveness, it's, it's going to be because of the word of God, inspired, preserved. God's word. That's what inspiration is. Preserved. You have them today. You can speak them. You can read them. You can write them. You can copy them. You can give them to people. Right? If they're not preserved, then how can you give them to people? Well, we just have to give people the meaning. Remember last week's lesson? How that idea in the 20th century really corrupted things? That it's not the words that matter, it's the meaning that matters. Okay. It affects the translation and preservation process, too. 
In Psalm 12, verse 7, people think this is the only verse people use to talk about preservation. It is not. But Psalm 12, verse 7 talks about the words and the need for right words and preserved words. And he says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The response of people to this verse, not the others I've quoted to you already, is that, well, that verse is talking about preserving people. If you read Psalm 12, the people are crying out for God's words to keep them. Yeah. Even if it were the people, they need the words of God. Preservation, which gives us some clue here. Preservation is not just the words themselves, it's the people in which they work. That's a truth about doctrine of preservation. Well, this changes things. Because the modern theory of textual criticism is that if you find words in the dirt, no matter if no one in history ever read them, that could be the Word of God. But what if the doctrine of preservation requires the words be working in people? Yeah. That if you find words that no one's ever read before, this is what that tells you. Not the preserved words of God. Right? Can you understand that? Yeah. Well, you don't have three PhDs. Right? That seems pretty simple to understand, though. If God promises to preserve His words through the effectual working in people, if you find words that no one's ever read before, maybe you should put them in a museum somewhere or yeah. burn them, you know. And that's heresy, what I just said there, burning manuscripts. <laughs> if I believe God already had his word in my hand, what do I need those? Yeah. Isn't that another common sense idea? If you believe that you have the word of God right there in your hand, does it matter to you what happens to the most ancient manuscript? Like, people get all pious, they talk about manuscripts, right? Oh, man, it's a sacred text. Have you ever read a manuscript? Like an actual manuscript? Like, do you cherish them? I've got a couple at home. Like ancient Bible leaves from the King James Bible 1611 and other versions. I've got them on the wall. It's, like I have them. it's a neat little thing. Look at this piece of history. The paper was a lot more durable back then. It's fascinating. Pointless. Collector's item. I don't pull out and study it when I need to study the Word of God. Because I have a Bible. Yeah. Right? Like, I have it right here. And so the point is, if you have the Bible, does it matter to you what happens to these over here? We've got a part of a piece that we found in the 4th century. Well, that's, fa I'm that's fascinating. I'm interested in that. But am I going to use that to study every day? Am I going to take that out to evangelize? Hey, guys, Jesus Christ is God. Hold on. Ancient papyrus. <laughs> like, th that's not what does it. But this is the modern Christian idea. Yeah. The textual critics, they're the ultimate source of evidence. If we're going to show people the manuscript evidence. No. You show people the words of God, purely preserved, perfectly preserved and preached, that affect people's hearts. That's how you get saved. That's how you know it's the word of God, is that you're saved by it, that you live by it. It works in you. Not because, oh, we've got enough evidences in history. Right? That's not it. But when culture shifted from a matter of believing truth and absolute truth in God to we need to trust the science, you've heard that a few times, that's where it went in textual criticism too. Trust the science over your priest, over your pastor, or whatever it is. So it shifted that way. Corruption happened as well. How long will it endure? Forever. Isaiah 30, verse 8. We covered Isaiah, verse, chapter by chapter. 91 weeks we spent in Isaiah. Isaiah 30, verse 8. You know why we did that? You know why we studied the Bible verse by verse? Because we believe that these are the words of God. Amen. If we don't believe we have them, it's less important we study verse by verse. I mean, who cares about some of the verses that trouble people? Just get the meaning. That's it. Move on. Isaiah 30, verse 8. Now go, God says, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. Why did God inspire things? Not so they'd be lost in the first few centuries. So they'd be preserved forever. Yeah. Where would they be preserved? He's writing this to Isaiah. In those that believe. Where do I find God's word? Well, if you're looking in history... Look where there are believers. Maybe you should today look where there's believers. Yeah. Like find today, where are the students of Scripture? Those who live by it. I'm not talking about religious studies and philologists. I'm talking about those who use and study the Bible. Yeah. Right? And that's been a survey you hardly ever see publicized. It's always best-selling translations and things. But consistently, the Bible that is more consistently studied is the King James Bible. Why is that? Maybe people care about the words, and they're thinking about where it comes from. Right? But that's just one issue here regarding preservation. Isaiah 30, verse 8, it'll be kept for the time forever. 
Can we be certain we have the words of God? Look at Isaiah 8, verse 19. We can't be certain. Can you be certain of your salvation? Yeah. You can be as certain that you have the words of God in your hand as you can be certain about your salvation. That's what I'm telling you. Which is to say, if you're uncertain about your salvation, then I guess that goes hand in hand with it. But it's a contradictory thought to think that I can be as sure as anything in my eternal salvation, and yet I cannot be sure that the book I have in my hand is the Word of God. That's dangerous. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19 and 20. When they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead? When people tell you, go find an expert, go find someone skilled, go find someone who dabbles in these things, these mystical arts of science, right? Science is actually biblically based, not the way it's practiced these days as the sole authority of truth. But he says, should not people seek to their God? Isn't that where you, that, that's where you should find truth? Verse 20, seek the law and the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. You see the standard in Isaiah 8, 19 and 20? You're looking for experts to tell you what's true. Shouldn't you seek to God for what's true? And what he says is true, that's true. You compare what everyone else says to it. Amen. But we can't do that if we don't have the Bible preserved. We're looking for experts in the story. What the experts say is. What happens if the whole church is using and studying and growing and saved from a text? It doesn't matter if the most recent finding discounts what we think is the Bible. That doesn't happen. Why is John 8 still in the scripture? John 8, 1 through 5, the adulterous woman. Right, you know the story? You without sin cast the first stone, you heard of it? Like, pretty ancient idea. You won't find a textual critic in 2022 that is among the chief textual critics of the Bible that thinks that's actually the Word of God. That's why they all footnote it. It's in, in the Bibles, but they have a footnote that says that this is not in the oldest and the best. Not there. It doesn't matter who used it. Doesn't matter who believed it. Doesn't matter how much the church, in fact, the reason they left it in, if you read why they left it in, you say, why'd they leave it in? Because they took out other verses. Right? They left it in because the church wasn't ready to receive the idea that this wasn't the Word of God. So they're even consulting the church. But if they're the expert, why do they have to? You know what I'm telling you? But if the church is an authority or believers are an authority in God's Word, shouldn't we look back to the history of believers and find where God's Word was? You see? It's contradictory, their thought process. Proverbs 22, verse 19 and 20. This is often the idea when it comes to science, folks. People study the Bible on Sundays, on Tuesdays, whenever they go to study their science, and they take out their faith. And they think that's an improvement. You can never get certainty like that. Well, you we shouldn't be so certain, you fundamentalist. Proverbs 22, verse 19. He says... That thy trust may be in the Lord, I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Have not I written to thee excellent things, written excellent things and counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. The writer here is saying, I've written these things down so you may know for sure. If someone tells you something, you can be caused to doubt what they said. Did they really say, remember Genesis 3? Yeah? God told him. Was it written down? There's no record of it written down. Did he actually say, and Eve got it wrong a little bit, right? Maybe your memory's failing you. You write it down, it's written down. Black and white. That's why we have contracts, folks. There's contracts you sign for your house because no one will believe you. And you say, oh, no, no, the term was only for this much money. Show me the paper, right? Proverbs 22 says, you'll know the certainty of the words of truth because I've written these things to you, and they are the words of truth. Well, that's only applicable if you actually have the words of truth in your hand today. Otherwise, you can't be certain of anything you have in your hand, which is what the textual critics say, right? Colossians 2, verse 2 says that you may have the full assurance of understanding. You can only have that if you have full assurance of God's word. 2 Peter 1, verse 19, Peter says you have a more sure word of prophecy. Wow. How did God preserve his word? Well, Covers a few passages here, and I'll trust that you'll study some more about this on your own. Every lesson the last four weeks, I know, could be a half a year's teaching, folks. There's this, this is why we cannot teach you everything you need to know at church. That's why you need to have a Bible in your hands, so that you can study for yourself, to show yourself approved unto God, to learn a lot more of these things. How does God preserve his word? Well, number one, he's not concerned with the originals. 
He inspired the originals. I'm not saying he didn't inspire them. God's words written down, he inspired them. But he's not concerned about keeping the actual original documents, what's called the autographs, the original things that were written by Paul and James and, and Matthew and all that. The reason why I know that is in the Bible where there's accounts of this. In uh, Jeremiah 36, I'll tell you the, the story here of Jeremiah when God gave him some words. And he says, Jeremiah, write these things down in a book. 36, verse 2, take thee a roll of a book and write therein all the words I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah. So these aren't like nice words. So write them down. Now, he didn't always say that. He, he would send Jeremiah to preach, right? But here he's saying, write, write these things down in a book. He takes the book, okay, and he calls Baruch in verse 4, and Baruch wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord. God spoke to Jeremiah. Jeremiah spoke to Baruch, who was the scribe, and wrote the thing down. Baruch takes this book. He takes it to the leaders of Israel and Judah, and eventually... Jehoiada and these guys take this book, and they don't like the words. They rip it up with a pen knife, throw it into the fire. The original is gone. And throughout history, there's been many times where people have tried to rid themselves of the Bible. Get rid of it. Right? Jeremiah 36, same thing. The original writing, inspired of God. If we could have had that thing, man, we could have learned some truth, right? Ripped it up. What happened down in Jeremiah 36, verse 23? It came to pass that when Judah had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the pin knife, cast into the fire. Down in verse 20, oh, 27. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, again, after the king had burnt the roll, and the words which Baruch spoke at the mouth of Jeremiah, saying, Take thee again another roll, and write in it all the former words. Now, see what he said there? He doesn't say, I'll tell you again. He said, Write what you wrote before. Whoa! God, don't you know about scribal mistakes? Like, don't you understand that scribes, and they get sleepy, tired, hungry, they move away from the text, they write something else, they copy it, they duplicate it, they get it wrong, and this is what happens. God says, write the former words. Apparently, with true confidence that it's going to be just fine, right? And he does that, <laughs> he writes another copy of the words that he was told before. What happens here? Originals written, copies, 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 copies. Printing press, multitude of copies. What happens here? All that's wrong is what they say. What? Well, what's right? Something no one's ever read before. I don't think so. You see, this, it's common sense. It doesn't take an expert to understand these decisions to make. You, don't, you haven't read those manuscripts yet. So we're just taking at their word. By the way, when I say they hadn't read it before, it's at their word. The thousands of copies that we said before the Bible has witnesses throughout history more than any other ancient book, yeah. it, it confirms the traditional readings of the King James Bible. Amen. It's the thousands of copies that they disagree with in modern translations. It's the few that they most recently found. In fact, less than 1% of the manuscript evidence supports the modern renderings of these things. Less than 1%. Which means that whole idea, the Bible is attested to by more witnesses than any book in history, out the window. Because those other ones were corrupt, apparently. So... It actually has fewer witnesses than many other books in human history because the true readings are very few. So you tell me, is that the proper approach? Or is the multitude of copies, is that going to attest where the scripture's at? Jeremiah 36 talks about copies. Deuteronomy 10, remember Moses? He destroyed the originals too. He had the stones walk down the mountain, saw the idolatry, smashed the originals on the ground. You imagine you have to apologize to God for 40 days like that? Like, they didn't have a Kinko's up there. They didn't have, like, you know, print something out. He goes up there. They had to write it again on the stones. And he told Moses to do that, by the way. Moses had to rewrite the thing. And then he walks down with these tablets. And God tells him in Deuteronomy to put the tablets in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I know you don't know everything about the Scripture, but surely you remember the Ark of the Covenant? This sacred box that shall not be opened, that if someone touched it with their hands, they, they, they died? the thing that would be put in the Holy of Holies and no one could ever enter in to see it. And that's where the original tablets were. That's interesting. So today, the originals are where? No one has them. No one can access them. No one can get them. Well, how did Israel know the law if Moses put the original tablets in the Ark of the Covenant? Well, he also told them to make copies. Amen. Before you put it in there, make a copy. You put the originals in there and copy and copy and copy. That was the instruction of the law. Every house wrote scripture on their walls. That was the law. Every king had to write a copy of the law. From what? They didn't reopen the Ark of the Covenant. It was from a copy. Right. Copies of copies of copies of copies. That's how God preserves his word in Israel in the Old Testament. 
Jesus was born 2,000 years ago, and he says, give me the law, give me the word of God. Jesus, that's a copy, it's a copy. Don't you know we've long lost the thing? The originals are far gone. We're still digging in the dirt for the original scrolls. We can't find the Ark of the Covenant anywhere. Remember, it got lost, remember? Well, how do you know what it said originally? Copies. No. Okay, that's called preservation. Yeah. Read about that in Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 17. Read Deuteronomy 17 about the, the qualifications for a king and how they have to copy God's word, among other things, and you'd see how far removed we are politically from having a righteous king in our country at all. It's like, if the qualification of Deuteronomy 17 were the qualification of our president, you'd go through a lot of people. Oh, yeah. say, oh, he's elected, but sorry. Next. He's elected, but sorry. Next. They had to know the law, folks. In and out. God's law. Anyway. How does God preserve his word? Apparently, copies can be called the pure word of God. Yeah. In the process of preservation, at any age, at any time in history, if, because he's preserved the words of God, when you have the words of God, you can call them the words of God, the pure words of God. You don't have to say, well, this is just a copy. This is not the original. We can't be certain. This is never the language of the scripture. David in Psalm 19, centuries after the law was written and copied and copied, praises the word of God that he has and reads and meditates on every day. Amen. He praises it. His law. Luke 4, 21, Jesus stands up 2,000 years ago, which is 1,000 years after the law was given to Moses, and, or 1,500 years, and, and he stands up and reads the roll and says, the word of God is fulfilled. He calls that scripture the word of God. Right? I mentioned a couple weeks ago that God's word can be preserved through languages. People say, well, it can't be preserved through languages, so you can't translate it and preserve it through translation. You see that banner on the wall there? Some of you don't read that banner over there. It says, preserved in translation. Yeah. It's been on there for years. Never taught a lesson on it until just now. That's my fault. You should blame me for that. Preserved in translation, there's verses that prove that. Yeah. God's word inspired, preserved in translation, so that you can believe it unto salvation. That's the doctrine of the Bible. Very important doctrine, which is why it's on the wall. Right. Preserved through translation. You know, Moses spoke to Pharaoh. He didn't speak Hebrew. When yeah. Pharaoh spoke to uh, Moses, he spoke Hebrew? The slave language? No. Mark 15, 34, you know when Jesus died on the cross? You remember what they put on the cross above his head? A sign. Remember? What did it say? Do you remember? No, well, you don't know. You're like, There's a sign on the cross? Yeah. Luke 23, 38. Do you know what it says? It said, this is the king of the Jews. In what language? Greek and Latin and Hebrew. Luke 23, 38 says the superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. Well, which was the original? Languages apparently can preserve words. Apparently you can say the same thing in three different languages. Amen. Well, I don't know. I think the Greek's more closer to what the intent was than the Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. That's what it said. Eugene Nita's idea in the 20th century was that that's impossibility. You can never have an exact translation of any language in any other language because the semantics are all... The semantic domains that don't match up. Right. The Bible says something a little different. Apparently the inventor of language says, I'll preserve my words through it, and it's just fine. Amen. Okay. Acts 22 is written in Greek originally, people think. And yet Paul speaking Hebrew, it says in Acts 22 too, he spoke in the Hebrew tongue. Well, find me a Hebrew manuscript of Acts 22. You don't have it. It doesn't exist. So it's translated through language. Okay. It's been preserved at great cost throughout history and in God's word. In 2 Kings 22, when Josiah found the book of the law, guess where he found it? He found it in the dirt, somewhere where pagan religions believe, right? Underneath their, no, I'm lying to you. He didn't find it there at all. Where did he find it? In the house of the Lord. Right. 2 Kings 22, like where you'd expect to find the word of God, Amen. right? When he found the word of the Lord and read the thing, he was so distraught by the fact that we've been disobeying it. The great cost that he put into destroying the pagan temples and ridding the country of the impurities and saying, we're going to keep this thing. Well, you know how many animals you're going to sacrifice? He said, it doesn't matter. It's what the Word of God says to do. Yeah. To great cost, God's Word has been preserved by people who read it and obey it. Those who are concerned themselves less with the actual believing of the Scripture concern themselves less with the preservation of the Scripture, which means they're excited about any sort of odd and obscure text they can find. Yeah. I want the perfectly preserved words of God. Amen. Right? 2 Timothy 3.15, God's words were preserved through faithful people, families, and houses. That includes you folks. You are instrumental to the preservation of God's words. 
You say, I'm not a textual critic. You don't have to be. You speak English. You have God's words in English. Then you can preserve them. How? By believing them. Preaching them. Helping other people believe them. And guess what? They continue on. Well, you only believe that King James out of tradition. It's tradition because people have been using it for 400 years to get people saved. And they had it 400 years ago because... They collated the copies of manuscripts, by the way, before the printing press. What were people reading? Printed books? No. Manuscripts. Do you think when they actually collated the first printed Bibles back there in that stage of history, they would have said, hey, Joe Bob, Christian spiritual giant, and you over there, what manuscripts do you have? Or they say, don't want anything you peon laymen have. We're going to go dig in the dirt and find some new thing. It's ridiculous. Common sense would be like, let's gather together the manuscripts everyone's like, come on, give me your Bibles. We're going to print this thing. No more handwriting. Yay! You know. Like, people would love it. Yeah. That's called preservation. Amen. We'll go in a dark room, leave us alone, give us a few years and a few thousand dollars, and we will find a manuscript for you. That's not how it worked. That's how it works today. You see, something's wrong here. Something's awry. We've had a book in print for a long time. Yes. Right? Anyway, modern theory of Bible translation and preservation admits the impossibility to reconstruct the, the originals. It rewrites history to say that we lost it for 1,500 years. It loses the text. That's why they say they're trying to rebuild it. It relies on scant support. Very few manuscript evidence actually supports the thing. It uses an inferior preservation criteria, which is looking at things that are old, odd, and unusual. That's an inferior preservation criteria. Right. Give me God's words consistently in the people that believe them. That's where I'm going to find it. Amen. Right. That's modern theory. And in juxtaposition to translations that have derived from this modern textual theory, which is why they all have the same differences, is an English Bible that has been unchanged. Yes. Additions notwithstanding, unchanged in principle for 400 years plus. And it is the King James Bible, which wasn't called that originally. It was just the Bible. Why are you King James only? If you study the issue out, what you leave about preservation dictates whether you're only or not, which only depends on which one it is in history. It wasn't called the NIV in 1611. Well, why does that matter in 1769? It's historical. Preservation is a historical doctrine. If it's brand new, it's not preserved. Right? That's the teaching. So knowing how God preserves his words gives us confidence to identify those words. And folks, notice the difference. I'll leave you with this just to think about. The doctrine of identification of the Bible. It is for you to say, this is the one in this version. To identify which version in English is the word of God. Okay? Requires you know the preservation of the word of God. Like how he does that. Okay? But the doctrine of preservation, which is God's words through history is also nothing unless you personally believe it. And this is the doctrine of identification. You holding a Bible saying, this book that I have is the word of God. It's your faith, your choice to believe this book in your hands. That's God's words in your heart and in your hands. You see, oh, that's the end goal, right? God wrote words in a book. God's words throughout history, preservation. You saying, this is God's word, that's you believing it. And that's where it needs to be. Right? Preserved in your heart right? and, and belief so that you can write it down and preserve it for other people. That is the doctrine of biblical preservation. Any questions and comments? Yeah.